A very good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my solid state presentation on the following paper from quantum matter to high temperature superconductivity in copper oxides, which I may also refer to as cuprates, published by Keimer and colleagues in Nature in 2015. We will start with a brief timeline. So in 1986, high temperature superconductivity was discovered in LBCO at 35 Kelvin. Then a lot of researchers started studying the cuprates and only seven years later, in 93, the record temperature was set by HGB CCO at a temperature of 135 Kelvin. Well, since then, of course, a lot more research has been done. And in 2015, this paper was published and it basically summarizes our understanding of the cuprate superconductors. And this will be our main goal for today, to give you a basic understanding of the high temperature cuprate superconductors. Now, if we look seven years later to today, uh, of course, a lot more research has been done and we will also be look at, taking a look at some of this. Now let's start with the contents for today. We will start by looking at the copper oxide structure and we will then use our knowledge of how this structure works to start building up the phase diagram. Once we have a basic understanding of the phase diagram, we can then look at the main claim the authors make and discuss this claim. We'll then look at further developments to see how the claim stacks up in recent research. And then we will finish off with a conclusion. So let's start with the copper oxide structure. The general structure for copper oxides is that we have vertically layered copper oxide planes, which are here indicated with the green and red. And then in between, we have insulating spacer layers. Now these spacer layers, usually they just donate an electron or a hole to the copper plane. And that's the best way or easiest way at least to look at it. Now, if we zoom in on these copper oxide planes, what we see is that we have strongly localized electrons on the copper oxides. And these pair antiferromagnetically due to super exchange of the oxygen atoms. Uh, and thus we expect an antiferromagnetic insulating phase at zero doping. Now, if we look at the phase diagram, this is exactly what we see. Below a certain temperature, the yield temperature, Tn, we indeed have an antiferromagnetic phase. Now, if we either increase the temperature or increase the doping, we expect indeed that this antiferromagnetic phase reduces in relative strength. For the temperature, it's because of thermal fluctuations. And for the increased doping, it's because we get more defects, so we get less strong coupling. And now we're going to play an experiment. We are going to slowly increase the whole doping and build up the rest of the phase diagram. Now, if we do this, we start to see new phases appear. So we see now that we get a pseudo gap below T star. Now a pseudo gap is where we have a severe reduction in the density of states, but it's not fully gapped out as we have in the superconducting phase. And what we also see is we see the superconducting dome, which is highlighted in green. And then uh, we also see different kinds of orders, including charge orders, but we will not be discussing these in today's talk. Now, if we further increase the doping, we find our full phase diagram. So we also see our full superconducting dome now, which is where superconductivity occurs. And we see our maximum critical temperature also in this regime. Now we also see our familiar Fermi liquid and we find our strange metal. But what is a strange metal? Let's dive into that. A strange metal is characterized by its poor conductivity. And it's also why it's sometimes called a bad metal. Now poor conductivity means poor compared to normal metals. But what is also very interesting about this regime is that we actually have a linear proportion, uh, a resistance that, li that is linearly proportional to the temperature. So usually for normal metals, what we see is that we have a T squared dependency at first, and then it plateaus out. Now we have a linear proportionality. And we can see it in this study published in this year by Young and colleagues. We can clearly see this linear dependence of the resistance as a function of temperature. But perhaps what's strangest about this whole thing is that there are actually no quasi-particles allowed uh, and there are no quasi-particles in this phase. And of course, it can also thus not be described by Fermi liquid theory. And now this is weird. But perhaps most importantly, and this is why I decided to cover it a bit more, is that it's actually the normal state of the cuprate superconductors. So for high enough temperatures, you will always get this strange metal. And it's also the precursor does to the pseudo gap. Now, if we look at the full phase diagram, there are some other things I wanted to point out. In both the pseudo gap and the Fermi liquid phase, we find that we have a resistivity that's proportional to T squared, 
and we have classic particles in both regimes. However, in the strange metal phase, we find a linear proportionality, actually for as high a temperature as measured for the cuprate superconductors with hole doping, and we find no quasi-particles. And this is weird because this means that you go from a phase where there are no quasi-particles, you cool down, and suddenly you start getting quasi-particles. And how all of this relates is simply not understood. We do not know. Uh, but at least we do have enough of an understanding of the phase diagram right now to look at the author's main claim. And what the author's claim is that pairs already start forming at the very high pseudogap temperature T star, and basically this is what causes the pseudogap. So if you remember from BCS theory, we have a normal metal at a given temperature. If we cool it down below the critical temperature, we start to get this condensate of Cooper pairs. And it's these pairs that actually... Uh, create the gap. Now, what they argue is that perhaps we do not have full superconductivity pairing, but we do have some level of pairing already far above the superconducting order. Okay, so let's look at how they built their arguments for this case. So first, they combined the findings of three studies studying the momentum space between T star and the critical temperature. And their findings are summarized in this figure over here we immediately see some symmetries. So both the pseudo gap uh, and the superconducting gap have the same symmetry around the node. And we also see that their maxima and minima coincide. Now, if we look at the Fermi surface, we actually see that it's gapped out where the pseudo gap has its maximum phase. And now the argument that the authors make is that pairs already start forming at T star, but it's phase fluctuations that prohibit superconducting order until much lower temperatures. Now, what does this mean? Phase fluctuations prohibiting superconducting order until much lower temperatures. Basically, what they're saying is, okay, if we have the cuprate as a system that's pretty big, we can have perhaps certain Cooper pairs already form in one region, but they're out of phase with Cooper pairs in the other region. And in BCS theory, when we get the condensate of Cooper pairs, we need, first of all, the Cooper pairs, but we also need all of the Cooper pairs to be in phase. So perhaps it's fluctuations in the phase that prohibit this superconducting state and lead to a pseudo gap. Pseudo, uh, gap. Now, they of course provide more arguments, which we will now look at. So they also looked at the study by Corson and colleagues in 1909. And in this study, they looked at the conductivity as a function of temperature. So if we look at this graph, we see the critical temperature indicated with the red line. We clearly see a spike at the conductivity here, but we already see that it starts to shoot up at far higher temperatures. And this is associated with superconductivity. And the argument is then that this is caused by preformed pairs. Now, perhaps the best circumstantial evidence that's given is done or comes from a study by Lee and colleagues in 2010, where they studied diamagnetism. And what they observed is that you find diamagnetism far above the critical temperature. So if we look at this graph, we see the critical temperature is around 13 Kelvin. And each shade of color here, that's not the darkest blue on the far right, indicates a certain strength of diamagnetism. And we clearly see that even at 50 Kelvin, we have diamagnetism. And so they argue that this is caused by preformed pairs. But the question remains, were they right? <laughs> or at least were they on the right track? Well, let's take a look at what further developments have to say about this. So a study by Chen and colleagues in 2019, where they studied bismuth-2212 using angle-resolved photoemission spectroscopy, found the following. They found that the pseudogap smoothly transitions into the superconducting gap. So the pseudogap transitioning into the superconducting gap is indicated by the red arrow, and I've marked both the super pseudogap uh, initial position, basically, at the superconducting gap initial position, and we do indeed find that it transitions smoothly. What they also did is they um, created a phase diagram. And now in this phase diagram, the black line indicates the superconducting dome. And what we see is we find superconducting fluctuations far above the critical temperature, uh, which is indicated with the shaded blue. And this is also evidence then for preformed pairs. Now, a study by Bozovic and colleagues in 2020, what they did provides the very best and most direct evidence actually of preformed pairs. They compared different shot noise junction tunneling experiments where they directly measured the number of uh, pairs tunneling through. 
And how they did this is actually pretty smart because what they do is they measure the intensity of the signal that's coming through and you can relate this then to the effective charge. Now, if your effective charge is much larger than the electron charge, you can determine the uh, percentage of pairs that must have come up here. And what they found is they found the following diagram. So we can see here the superconducting regime is within the red dome. And here we clearly see that there's a high probability of pairs tunneling through. But even outside this regime, we see that there's pairs tunneling through. So there's a non-zero probability, meaning that there, well, must be pairs. And what they actually do is they call these pairs preformed Cooper pairs. And now this is where it gets really interesting. So if we look at the following study by Lee and colleagues published in this year, in 2022, uh, where they also studied bismuth 2212 using ultra fast pump probe spectroscopy, which is a super accurate technique. And what it actually does is it allows you to study the dynamics of the quasi particles. And now what they found is super cool. Uh, they found that the quasi particle dynamics that they observe are actually consistent with electron phonon interactions. So indeed, we are probably looking at Cooper pairs. And now this is super weird, right? Because we would expect that phonon interactions or phonon mediated interactions become irrelevant above like 30 or 40 Kelvin. But here we have these high temperature superconductors uh, where we do see that the math says it's consistent with electron phonon interactions. So that's super cool. And what they also did is, well, they then explain okay, how does this occur? And what they say is that the pseudo gap is caused by Cooper pairs with a short coherence length. Now in BCS theory, what we have is we have these Cooper pairs form with long coherence lengths and they kind of all overlap and then they all condense at the same time with the same phase. Now what they say is that we have these uh, Cooper pairs form with short coherence lengths as is indicated on the figure here and some may overlap, but not all of them, definitely not most. And so we can have different parts of your cuprate, which all have Cooper pairs, which are locally in phase, but then globally are not necessarily in phase. And this then causes the pseudo gap, but not a full superconducting gap. So that's super cool. We will look at one more study, which was done by Miao and colleagues in 2021, where they used X-ray diffraction to look at LSCO. And what we, fi what we find is the following phase diagram. Now we again see superconducting fluctuations far above the critical temperature and in the pseudo gap. So this again uh, suggests that perhaps there are preformed pairs. But now if we look more closely, and this is what boggles my mind, is that we also see these same fluctuations in a strange metal phase. And now this is weird because we know that there cannot be quasi particles in a strange metal phase. So what is going on? Because the argument, if well, if the argument is that these superconducting fluctuations in the pseudo gap are caused by preformed pairs, then, and we see these same fluctuations in the strange metal phase, then would we not expect them to be caused by the same mechanism? Or if they're caused by a different mechanism, we would at least expect uh, there to be like a more discontinuous jump in the fluctuations, but we also do not see that. And this just boggles my mind. Like, I, I do not understand it. And quite frankly, I think no one does. One alternative explanation I came up with is that perhaps we actually have a pseudo gap that's covering the whole superconducting dome. It's just that we've not been able to measure it because it becomes so tiny, small. And in that scenario, you would always have a strange metal, then a pseudo gap phase, and only then you have the superconducting phase. But I guess this is still a unresolved mystery and it's been a beautiful one. See. So that brings us to today's conclusion. So what we did is we looked back at more than 30 years of history of research on the cuprate superconductors and basically what we found is that they are super weird. There is a lot of there are a lot of things going on that we simply do not understand. Uh, our theories are not able to explain them and so we will need new theories to actually be able to understand them. What we also find is that the pseudo gap is most likely a precursor to the superconducting gap. And perhaps most importantly, we have now found good evidence for the existence of Cooper pairs far above the critical temperature. However, these are Cooper pairs with short coherence lengths instead of long coherence lengths. And 
And with that, I would like to wrap up this beautiful unresolved mystery. And I would like to thank you all for coming to my solid state talk. And with that, it's now time for questions. <laughs>